Well, thank you for joining us today on St. Patrick's Day. It is um, March the 17th of 2021, and I am Deborah Tavares. I do run a couple of websites. My primary site is StopTheCrime.net, but we're going to be focusing on a website uh, that is called PrimaryWater.org. Now, when you search for that site, you must not put spaces between primary and water because then you will not find the website. They've cleverly created a method in which it is more difficult now for you to find the water facts. And I'm going to be bringing on a guest in a few moments and introducing him in a moment, but I, I want to say this now. I can't say this more clearly. Uh, we are in water wars. We're in a hot war in many levels now not only in the United States, but worldwide. And we are in USA, Inc., as I have been saying for so many years. But now they're stealing the water for profits and power. In fact, I have a YouTube video up that I did in the year 2015. It is still up on YouTube, on our new YouTube channel called Stop the Crime. YouTube is continuously banning my information and our guests' information as well, which you will learn about in a moment. But it, I have this video up, and you need to listen to it, and you need to understand the importance of getting to a reliable source of water, which is what we're going to be talking about. The name of the video on my site is called Water Wars, Stealing Water for Profit and Power. And you certainly need to understand that one of the many wars of the 21st century will be fought over water rather than oil, as in the last century. So uh, we're, we're going to be um, talking about this today uh, with a gentleman that I've known for a number of years now. Uh, he is known as the Hungarian Water Wizard. I uh, did He and I did a video together called Primary Water Explained. The only way you can find that video now, since it has been deleted from YouTube, they do not want you to know that water is a renewable energy resource. So this will be the best radio show I've done in a long time with the real water facts that we are not running out of water. But we have moneyed controllers, Rothschild and Rockefeller, that are dead set in stealing and metering the water, allocating it, and forcing relocations of communities based on turning off the spigot with the illusion that they've run out of water. So I, I want to certainly say this um, before I bring my guest on. This is most important because um, on December 8th of 2020, just a few months ago, Wall Street began trading water futures as a commodity. Wall Street has begun trading water as a commodity like gold and, and oil. The country's first water market was launched on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with $1.1 billion in contracts tied to water prices in California. And this is from Bloomberg News. Now, Bloomberg is part of the controlling vehicle. Do not think of Bloomberg philanthropies and other philanthropies as, as being good. They're not. They're part of the takeover of this country and the global uh, countries as well. So when you hear their reports, pay attention. They're telling you how they're going to attack us. So um, I'm going to talk about my guest, and then I will bring him on, because you need to know a little of his background and understand that he has been attacked, too. Uh, his primary water article that was on Wikipedia was deleted um, in 2016. And uh, what this article basically says um, is um, that um, Stephen Reese of California formulated a theory that new water, which never existed before, is consistently being formed within the earth by the combination of elemental oxygen and hydrogen, and that this water finds its way to the surface 
and can be located and tapped to constitute a steady and unfailing new supply of water, meaning it's a renewable. And there was a nonprofit, and it still is in existence. It's called the Nonprofit Primary Water Institute dot org, and you can find this Primary Water Institute dot org was founded in 2014 by longtime Reese protege Paul Power to educate and train the next generation of primary water specialists. And it is with my great honor and reg- highest regards that I have Paul Power with me right now, who is called the Hungarian Water Wizard. Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on the Power Hour and to talk about really the um, passion of your life to bring water to people. So I'd like for you to just give an idea to people of, um, well, of what, well, I, I just want to interject this, Paul, and I hope that you don't mind. It's very important for everyone to know that Paul was burned out in Oregon during one of the recent fires, so he lost everything. And um, uh, it, it, we are all being mercilessly attacked in many different ways. So it's with this understanding that um, you need to understand uh, Paul's position and predicament at this time. But, Paul, as we know that you suffered a great loss during the process of losing everything, your home in Oregon, um, let's tell people about how many uh, water uh, wells you've drilled, roughly. Between 800 and 1,000. So between 800 and 1,000 wells, where where are the regions of these wells that you drilled? Basically, all, all the continents, uh, including East and West Africa, Europe, the U.S., mostly the West Coast, and uh, Australia. In other words, we pretty much covered the continents. Okay. And um, Steve, Stephen Reese was your mentor, and I know that you started uh, working with him when you were 18 years old um, and that you were starting to then understand about primary water. But I want to throw this in, and I, I feel it's important because you're hearing a man whose passion it has been to bring primary water to the world. And to understand that in Hungary, where Paul is from, that those people that have been drinking primary water, and albeit not all have realized that they've that they're drinking primary water because it can easily surface in um, um, other fashions, have higher IQs. Isn't that correct, Paul? Yes, they they tend to be at the foot of the Carpathian Mountains. And uh, that's a very interesting phenomenon. Actually, uh, they call it the Hungarian phenomenon, which uh, ironically points up the uh, fact that a good many scientists, uh, actually Hungary, two-thirds of its scientists come from that region. So uh, So we're talking about higher IQs, definitely. Oh, yes, most certainly. Okay, so for all of you that are listening, I hope that you're understanding that if you are able to drill and get to primary water, which doesn't always require drilling, that you should be considering this. And, uh, Paul, I'd like you – now, I've been on uh, several uh, primary water drills with you, so I know what that looks like, and um, I uh, certainly have seen this for myself. But I would like you to explain um, to people uh, how, what, the, how, what, is, what is primary water? What's the difference between rain and snow melt, which is atmospheric water? Let's talk about that for a moment. Well, um, atmospheric water uh, is, what, is water that uh, has been recycled and uh, comes out of the sky in the form of rain, etc., and uh, permeates the uh, the alluvial fan, the sands and gravels that are easily penetrated by water. Primary water, on the other hand, is drilled into basically solid rock, uh, 
maybe very little very little uh, overburden that is to say uh, unsorted material otherwise solid rock so you you are doing the impossible you're getting water out of solid rock <laughs> which people wonder how could that be well if you understand that primary water is made down below and is forced through these fractures to the surface then it's easier easier to understand well, Paul, I wanted to say that we had an earthquake a few years ago in Napa in Northern California, which really destroyed the downtown area of Napa. But what occurred was a creek that had been dry because we were in a engineered lengthy drought, and the creek was just dirt. And after that earthquake, the creek started to run. And all the city council members and the water uh, advisors were scratching their head. They had no idea what happened. Could you explain what you think uh, happened to create that that flow of water after the earthquake? Well, de depending on the location, the, the, this planet is pretty much riddled with faults and fractures all the way down to the mantle. So what has happened there? Is, is this earthquake removed some of the blockage that blocked the uh, upward movement of water through these through these faulted structures, and thereupon letting the water flow free? I don't know if I'm, I'm being clear enough, but uh, suddenly, suddenly this overburden, which was solid, got moved out of the way. Oui. So suddenly. It's fracture now could produce water. Well, you know what was interesting, Paul, when I was observing your drilling some of these wells, I was observing the um, development of the well, and very different from the traditional well drillers of wells where they uh, they case uh, they use a liner, a plastic liner, all the way down to the depth of the well in most cases, and they gravel pack it. So that is preventing the water from coming into the well. Isn't that right? Well, the the idea with the gravel pack is to uh, basically filter out any of the fines or the or the material that is that is produced, you know, in the process of make, make of the well making water. Well, that is very counterproductive because if you are in solid structure, like even granite, invariably. You only need enough uh, uh, casing, well casing, to be able to seal the surface down to the whatever the county or state or the city requirement is. On the average, somewhere around 30 feet. And uh, otherwise, you leave the well open. You don't gravel pack for sure, because the gravel pack only only behaves like a screen, and old like old screens eventually. Within even on a decade or two or less, it will get plugged, and then you lose the well, and then you don't have any more water production. So we're hearing a lot of wells that are going dry that have been drilled in the fashion that you are explaining. So let me break that down from what I saw, and and I want to make sure I'm saying this right, Paul. So if you need okay. to correct me in any way, I wish that you would. What I saw okay. when we were drilling is what you had just said. You case through the, the soft soil, the alluvial, which means the soft material, till you get down to the rock, and then you don't have to case. The reason you case to get until you get to the rock is so that that soft material will not fall in to the well that you're drilling. Then I, I, okay, good. Uh, then what I also observed was uh, to develop the well, which I had never heard about the need to develop a well, which is extremely different from the traditional well drilling. And it's a sad reality that the well drillers are taught virtually how not to get to primary water. But what I discovered and what, what we did and what I saw was to develop the well after the well, uh, after it was cased to through um, the soft soil, then to the granite where it wasn't cased, uh, there was dry ice 
uh, put into the well, and of course that can be very dangerous, so you have to stand back and put it in very safely and stand back. And uh, it, it, I heard it gurgling like a washing machine, Paul, and, and uh, explain what that was doing to folks. Basically, uh, it was, it was um, the gases were expanding in the fracture, and slowly, because the dry ice itself is sub-zero temperatures, when you drop it into water, large chunks will settle to the bottom and immediately start to turn into CO2. And that CO2 goes into the fracture. And then, and then you permit that to come back. It cleans the right after right after drilling. It, it is very wise, depending on how much production. If you have too much production, you can't do it. But if you have a, a, a smaller fracture, it pays to do that so that you're actually cleaning the fracture itself. And, and then you can pump it out or let it blow itself out. But uh, basically, well, you develop it this way, and then you start. Then you start pumping, and really, the pumping, the rate of pumping, is twenty percent of the accepted expected production. So, so the development of the well is very, very important. Well, you know, it's important that you're saying this because people are not aware that that's part of well drilling, and sadly, they rely on hiring a well driller to know these things. And the well drillers do not. Most do not. So what you're hearing right now is what you need to know to be able to make certain is done if you decide to get to primary water. And I will say I know that a couple of the wells that I was um, attending that you had uh, drilled, when that uh, dry ice was gurgling around and we were standing back, suddenly it blew out of the well. And I think it blew up, blew out of the well up to about 40 feet in height. It was unbelievable. It looked like a geyser. And at first it was brown, a lot of mud, sediment, just like you were saying, was, clean, was cleaned out. And then it started to, to turn more clear. So that would be the purpose then of, of needing to know that the wells need to be developed. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. In, in, in some cases, you can't. You, you, you're making way too much water, so you you, you can't do that. But in half half the okay. time, you, you can. Okay. So if the well is already producing, then then um, producing uh, enough gallons per minute. Because it, as you were saying, it, it will vary on what fracture you drill into. But if it's, um, a, you know, not a tremendous amount of water that you've drilled into, uh, then you should be looking at um, developing that well. So let's talk about why uh, the information is being taken off of Wikipedia uh, about your information. And I would highly recommend that all of you go. Um, I mirror uh, Paul's website, which is primarywaterinstitute.org. I have primarywater.org. And remember, do not put spaces when you type in primary water. Type it together, primarywater.org. I uh, have the Water Bible uh, that you have that I, I got from you, Paul, on my website. I think everybody needs to read that because the foreword is by Aldous Huxley. And um, I was stunned when I found out that uh, water was a renewable. I had never been taught that, ever. And I remember when we met a number of years ago and we were on the phone talking late at night. And for many, uh, Paul has a, a, an accent, but of course I've gotten used to it. So uh, at that time, I thought I was understanding what he was saying, and it was just too outrageous, Paul, I have to say. At the time, it took me a while to wrap my head around what you were saying, that water is truly a renewable, and it's why we don't have a water shortage. That was hard. When I heard that, um, I was stunned, quite honestly. 
um, what is the reaction from people that you're talking to? I know that you're drilling a lot of wells, and I know that you have many wells scheduled to drill at this moment as well. But um, eight to a thousand wells for the condition that we're in in this world, and particularly in Australia with the shortages of water and losing hundreds and thousands of cattle during some of these massive heat events that are certainly created by weather weapons in Australia and everywhere else, and in Africa too, um, you would think that there would be thousands upon thousands of water of these t- prim- primary wells. Why is it that you think that there aren't more than the ones that you've drilled? Well, first of all, first of all, there has to be funds spent. You, you need money to drill, and you need proper uh, drilling rigs, and and they are not that, they are not cheap, and there are not that many. There are quite a few really outstanding drillers, but by and large, well over half of them, and uh, you know they they don't even know how to use their for forgive me their equipment. The ones that are good are really good, and the bad ones are really bad. So that's one well, of the reasons. And, and yeah, you need, well, that is and, and you that need, is a f- and also also you got to remove the obstacle of the of uh, they, they they really don't want many of these places. The governments don't want uh, more water because more water means more people and more development and more activity. And you know more it's, food, it's, it's not more the, food, Paul, yeah, and more food. Yes, so. The, the, the best places that I really enjoyed working was in Africa, because in, I, I, go, I, go, I only work in places as, as a rule where there is no, not supposed to be any water. Well, wrong. I don't, I don't work anywhere where there is already water. I mean, all kinds of surface water. So uh, I, I work in places where there is a drought, no water, and stuff like that. And that, that is very gratifying. It's, it's very gratifying to, like, for example, work in Kenya on quite a few different projects where, you know, you are the only Muzungu, the only white man there, and everybody's watching you. They haven't had any water, drinking water. They've been hauling it for many miles. Now, Paul, we're coming up on a break, and I want you to pick that story up on the other side. So everybody stay there. We're going to pick up primary water drilling and how you can get to primary water. Well, welcome back, everyone. This is Deborah Tavares. I am talking with the Hungarian water wizard, Paul Power, and we are talking about primary water. Uh, Paul's website is primarywaterinstitute.org, um, and my website, uh, which also takes you to his is called primarywater.org, where you can print off flyers and distribute this information far and wide. So all of you that are listening, please do that. Go to my website, primarywater.org. Now, when you type in primary water, you have to uh, uh, omit the space in between primary and water, or you will not be able to get to the website. I found that to be a tricky way that our controllers have created the inability to find out the truth about water. This is critical information for all of you that are listening because right now they are creating water markets. They're going to start allocating water, cutting off your access to water by having already started to deploy all the wireless smart meters in your cities right now. So you are going to be essentially lynched and dried out and relocated when they tell you your area is out of water. Now, prior to the break, Paul was talking about um, the, the best places that he enjoyed drilling the most were the areas that there was seemingly no water and that there were uh, long droughts, and that was in Africa. And he was telling us about Kenya in particular, and... Um, then uh, we started to talk about other things in between the break, and I'm going to go into that now because this is absolutely critical that each and every one of you understand because we're being deceived by what is occurring with the process of water. 
So, Paul, we were talking about um, uh, well drillers hitting water, and they'll hit water, and it won't be, it, they'll still be in what you call alluvial soil. So for everybody, keep in mind, alluvial soil is not getting you into the rock material. So you may be getting water by your typical well driller, but it's like being in a bathtub. Is this correct, Paul? That's correct. And that they have to drill deeper um, or even well, off to a slant in order to get into the rock. Would that be correct? Well, uh, I prefer not to drill slant, but uh, uh, anyhow, you have to drill. You preferably try to pick places where you have bedrock right, right off the bed on top so you don't have any overburden, which is that alluvial soil that you are talking about. Because that alluvial alluvial fan it makes up a good part of the uh, of the Great Valley in California too. And you know, now the Great Valley in California good. for everyone that's listening, that would be the San Joaquin Valley. And that produces a large portion of our our nation's uh, fruits and vegetables. And they have had limited access to water through the illusion of having running out of water. In fact, thousands and thousands of acres have gone um, unplanted because there's just not enough water. And when you drive up between San Francisco and Los Angeles, you'll see the farmers' huge signs along the main highway saying we're out of water. No water, no food. And they keep appealing to Congress. And they're they're um, certainly talking about the diversion of the water from the California aqueduct and uh, other diversions, but they've never been given the truth about primary water. And so farmers are literally going out of water. And many of the migrant workers communities there, Paul, are out of water and they have water tanks and their water is being trucked in on into tanks. Polyurethane tanks, by the way, that are 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 toxic to begin with. But having said that, we were talking uh, about uh, low lying coastal areas in the center in central California. So for those of you that don't know uh, California well, just kind of think um, a, a hun- couple hundred miles, I guess, below San Francisco on the coast. Would that be about about the right location of the Santa Clara Valley, Paul? Yes. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to explain is if you visualize the valley, visualize a bathtub that is full of sand and gravel, okay? And that bathtub has a bottom. Now, the water to it invariably comes from the sky in the form of rain, fall, or snow melt. Otherwise, you have to, tr- you have to pump the water from someplace. You can recharge those, those uh, aquifers by putting water in there from somewhere. Uh, we have, incidentally, we have plenty of water everywhere, except sometimes where they drill. <laughs> they, they, I don't, you know, it, it absolutely is befuddling to, to, to see these people trying to get water in places where you have to go through 500 feet of alluvial fan, but you have to, you have to case down before you even get close to where the water really is produced from down below. Anyhow, they, they, they do this regularly. Uh, in, in, in Ventura County, there's the Santa Clara Valley, which is the, the, uh, basically the Santa Clara River empties into the Pacific by Point Magoo. That whole valley traditionally had wells before there was a California aqueduct. They would overpump that, then the sea would move in. Salt water because- so, so let me stop you right there, because I want to repeat this in layman's terms. I think you did an excellent job, and that sounds pretty layman to me. But in the beginning, my ears did not hear that very well. So uh, let me just repeat, and you correct me if I'm not um, uh, describing this correctly. So all of you, you need to think about low-lying areas where the the coastal um, range is is low, almost maybe to sea level and maybe a little bit higher than sea level. And when those um, uh, aquifers are pumped dry, then the sea moves in and fills those aquifers. 
So then what happens is the farmland then is no longer able to be farmed because of the intrusion of salt water. And you were saying how what they've been doing since the 50s to keep those over-pumped aquifers full so they don't lose all that farmland. Would you explain to everybody the enormity and insanity of this deception and how they've kept those aquifers filled so they won't fill with salt water? Yeah, they take the... Now, it's easy enough to do... When I say easy enough, it's expensive because they have to get the water somewhere. So they're getting it out of the California aqueduct. So they're recharging those structures with water from the California aqueduct. Now, the problem is with it is that sometimes there really isn't enough water to go around even out of the California aqueduct. So then, so here we are, you know, we, we've got a real problem here. Uh, first of all, over-pumping is nothing new. Uh, if you understand the magnitude of this, there is a study that suggests that the entire valley, the Great Valley itself, fluctuates in elevation above sea level as much as two feet, depending on how much water are being pumped out of the alluvial fan, alluvium. Can you imagine that? So that's actually creating a, somewhat of a seismic type of activity then, is what you're saying, because we've seen cracks in the roads and that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And then not only that, but, uh, you know, they, 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 they so that, that also now puts restrictions on building and any all, all activity. They say, well, you can't do this because uh, they're, they're over-pumping this aquifer. So what do you do? In the California Valley, in the Great Valley, we don't simply have enough water from anywhere that could that could keep that in, in an even keel. Well, now, I think you know, it's important to add that, of course, with um, the use of weather technologies that can create the droughts that we're experiencing here in California and elsewhere, that preventing the rain and then creating the manufactured disinformation about where water comes from, rain and snowmelt, and not ever addressing the fact that that's atmospheric water, very toxic and poisonous, by the way, uh, but avoiding any any knowledge of what we're talking about right now. So, Paul, we've spoken in the past about the California aqueduct, and I read on your website, again, Paul's website is primarywaterinstitute.org, and I read on your website, and I have it also on mine, about why we never needed the California aqueduct in the first place. So could you explain what an alternative to that would have been? It reminds me of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya putting in the wells and bringing the water to his villages. So would you explain why we never needed the California aqueduct? Because because we could have drilled for a fraction of the cost of the California aqueduct, a more reliable system of wells approximately 7,000 of them in all, starting somewhere around Susan, all the way down to the border, uh, at the, the foot of the Sierras, most of them. And we have ample water, and a far more reliable in that that, that my, my biggest fear has always been, and God has been really good to the state of California, because we, ne- we haven't had an earthquake so great as to have dislocated this artificial river system that we have built on the surface. You can imagine what happened, what, what will happen. And it's going to happen eventually. I mean, there's no way to. Uh, the aqueduct itself is, is is concrete. Now, we're going to have an earthquake one of these days when that's going to be dislocated a half a dozen places. And and it's, it's going to be held to glue it back together in, in a hurry with 18 or 20 million people waiting to, to, to drink water. <laughs> Well, Paul, I want to add something for the listeners, because certainly they're well aware of my prior um, uh, documents, and we know that earthquakes are also created artificially. So one can imagine that this would be a, a perfect way to increase the loss of life, which is part of the genocide policies overall.
is cut the water supply because um, uh, certainly uh, people would die without water. Now, Paul, uh, what? How do you? How? What is your experience, if any, with how primary water wells withstand seismic shifts? Some of them, depending on how close they are to the structure, but the fact of the matter is, we would not have all of our eggs in one basket. We could, we could afford to lose ten, twenty percent of our of our wells, and still still function okay. We just would have to re, uh, redo, but uh, but the aqueduct, boy, that would take. If, if that aqueduct would get dislocated a half a dozen places, my God, you know, it would take it would take way too long, way too long of a time for, for those people to. I mean, what are they going to do in the meantime for water? Because well, it now, would bankrupt the state. It would force uh, migration because of the inability to access water. Sounds pretty much along the lines of you in Agenda 21 plans to forcibly relocate people. And so um, with that the in mind... The the most, but the, earthquake, the earthquakes regarding water wells, because we are not having all of our eggs in one basket, could, could uh, destroy maybe 20% of the ability to produce water in California. But if we had one major one, that uh, along the uh, along the aqueduct, that would finish the state, as far as I'm concerned. But the okay, problem so, was, yeah, uh, everyone that's listening, you need to he- pay close attention to what Paul is saying, because for all of you, you are by and large getting water through artificial processes, through reservoirs, and the use of damming up water and having that water delivered into your municipal water supplies. Very toxic. Very toxic water. Let me let me add that let me add further that all these open reservoirs that 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 presently store the water from from the California aqueduct, my God, they are they are subject to to contamination from the atmosphere. God forbid we should have a nuclear accident. What what then? All of our surface waters would be contaminated. Now, well, now this Paul, is really, for many this people, really... yeah. For men, let me pause you for a moment. For many people, they are aware that we've not we've had nuclear events, but they haven't been accidents, and it's been intentional because I've been reporting on that. But we've had Fukushima, and just uh, a week or so ago, it was the tenth year since the Fukushima destruction. Um, through the use of weapons, which occurred on March 11th of 2011. And I've reported, Paul, on uh, my last video about the increased gamma radiation within the United States. So we are having those open areas of water poisoned with many things, not just the chemtrails and the dumping from overhead, but the increased radiation as well as the the catchment of that uh, flowing over farmlands that use uh, petrochemicals that are deadly and poisonous. So so continue, Paul, because I think this is so valuable for people to be hearing. Let me interject into into saying that the difference now with primary water that you are drilled into solid rock, in other words, basically we are drilling into granite, and we are able to seal off everything from the surface. So no surface material that comes out of the sky or because of carelessness uh, would pollute the water source uh, out of that well because now we are in solid granite and we are able to seal the surface, say, 30 feet down, 25 feet down, so that nothing from the surface can, can get into that water. So we will always be guaranteed safe, clean drinking water. And higher IQs. Yes. So I hope that every one of you that are listening will go to Paul's website and learn the true water facts that are being deceived and being removed from your ability to understand how water really works. Um, Paul, I'm going to have you back on a number of shows uh, to discuss this in greater detail. Because the enormity of this information needs many conversations. Many people 
uh, I'll get questions, I'm sure. And from those questions, we'll do a show and answer some of those questions that people have. But I would Debra, suggest... Debra, me, yes, let, go let ahead, Paul. One, one more item to it, uh, to, the, to the listeners. Have you guys ever picked up a glass of water and, and, and looked at it and say, hey, what is this stuff? That's two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Now, how could that be liquid? That's that's basically what started me off on this 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 insanity of trying to explain water. Now, how do you explain that? Well, I tell you how you explain that. And those those basic elements are depth under in the planet. They still it, it, the planet makes more water. Actually, our planet is growing ever so slightly. Because now, when you mean growing, it's because it's expanding because of water. Because of because now water takes up room. Uh, yes. The gases you can compress. It takes up not much, but the minute it turns into water, water you cannot compress. So, so I, I just wondered if you, if if, if the audience picking up a glass of liquid water, make most of that stuff is because of water. Realizing that they are drinking two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and that's what set me off. I thought Steve Reese, when I held up a glass of water, said, "Hey, where did this one come from? How, how, how come?" And I thought to myself, "You know, this is really interesting. I better, by God, I better look into it." The more I looked into it, the more confusing and the more complex it got. It, it, it is now easier to explain because. Now we are extracting hydrogen from water, and some of these vehicles actually, because of combustion, they uh, you can use hydrogen for power. And what 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 uh, drips out of the uh, tailpipe of these vehicles? Water. So now it's not so not so difficult for most people to understand. Well. I think this is an enormous teaching that you've just discussed in looking at a glass of water and realizing the hydrogen and oxygen elements of that and then thinking about why the liquid is dripping out of your tailpipe of your car and thinking about um, the fact that we are being deceived about where water comes from. We know that um, Momar Haddafi and the Great Man-Made River Project was b blown up when we blew up Libya. And uh, Momar Haddafi had access to primary water, and he was certainly directing uh, the underground desert plumbing to a number of the towns and villages there and, and offering those to his people for free. And that got blown that, up. That was, and that was the biggest, one of the biggest tragedies. Libya all by itself could have fed all of Africa. You know, well, that's had, definitely had, then why they blew it up, right, Paul? Well, it seemed to me a rather diabolic thing to do. Well, they sent the country into a humanitarian crisis, and they blew up the water drilling rigs that were acquired from London so that they could not be used to drill again. And uh, many villages were without water after they cut the water supply from the primary water delivery system. So for many of you that are unaware what um, the United States did to Libya in destroying the Great Man-Made River Project in Africa, you need to know the enormity of keeping and attempting to keep this a secret, even scrubbing Paul's information off of Wikipedia. They do not want you to hear what you are hearing right now. So please, please share this information far and wide. And Paul, we will have another show, and I will post all of these shows for everyone that's listening on StopTheCrime.net. Certainly, um, YouTube is not allowing this information to go out, so you can get to this information by just typing in stopthecrime.net. Uh, you will go to the home page. It will say our new YouTube video channel. Do not press on that at first. We're 
we're finding better luck in posting underneath that on our library um, uh, channel, and we haven't been taken down off of that. So um, we also, when you sign up, we will also be uh, doing email blasts with these videos within the emails that we're not able to post on YouTube. So there's many benefits to subscribe to StopTheCrime.net so you get information like you're hearing right now. And, Paul, I can't imagine anything more important than what you're saying right now. And we're heading towards the last few minutes of the show today. And if there would be one thing that you could leave the audience with, with the enormous good news of of having renewable water. What else might that be, Paul? Well, <clears throat> we are not running out of water, that's for sure. The problem is the quality, the quality of the water we are drinking, because we cannot occupy the surface and basically drinking out of our bathtub. I mean, we have to go to a place where the water is, in fact, clean. And enough, it doesn't have to be processed. But, Deborah, I'd like to say that it has been a privilege to be asked to, to participate here again. Um, I think old, old Steve Reese is smiling from heaven. Well, I, I, I can't thank you enough, Paul, for that late night discussion and informing me about primary water because I was literally thrown into a tailspin. And many of you may be as well, because it was such a shock to me to find out that it did not, water does not come from rain and snow melt. And for many of you, you've been watching the, um, the snow uh, that's been um, occurring throughout this country, particularly recently during Texas and other states. It was uh, polynucleated snow, where they could make a snowball and attempt to uh, melt it with a flame underneath, and those snowballs were turning black and they were not melting. So I want you to think of the water that you are drinking, which is atmospheric water, as being more poisonous than we've even had time to discuss on the show today. Paul, thank you very much. We're going to have you back on more shows. So everybody, sign up to StopTheCrime.net. And Paul, blessings to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie. You're a privilege.